Okay, so now on to morphological speculation. So Baxter and Cigar reconstruct seven morphological affixes. The prefixes S, capital N, M, T, K, an infix R, and a suffix S. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so first, tight pre initial, uh, now for morphological reasons. So all researchers appear to concur that uh, S had a causative function in Old Chinese. Uh, I think I sent out this handle article, but I, I certainly can if I didn't. Uh, and then Baxter and Cigar propose uh, this causative function, valence increasing on verbs. And they also have a prefix that derives circumstantial nouns, so nouns of place, time, or instrument uh, from verbs using this, um, this S prefix. And they employ etymological arguments in favor of an S prefix origin of the following Middle Chinese initials. And I, uh, I don't know, maybe I will read them. So S, S, R, Z, T, S, T, S, R, T, S, H, and T, S, R, H. Okay. So the valence increasing S. We have things like ton, rise of steam, so to rise intransitively, and stung to lift up, to save, to present to. We have uh, knock, to speak frankly, and sn snucks, to complain or to accuse. Eh, it's not so obvious that that's valence. No, it is, it is valence increasing, isn't it? Yeah. It's not really causative, but it's valence increasing. Uh, then we have uh, tongue, to match or have a value or rank with and stung to estimate, so to determine the value of, you know. Gi to look and ski to show. Okay, good, nice. Now the circumstantial noun prefix s, so we have rak to go against or reverse, and then snorak, the first day of the month when the moon changes from waning to waxing. So like the thing that reverses or the, 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 not the thing that reverses, even that would be the moon, the occasion where the thing reverses. Yeah. Um, and then we have um, to penetrate and slurong window, the place where light penetrates. Uh, but notice that there's this R infix that, you know, is left, um, unaccounted for. And it, I, I hope it's just cl clear to everyone. I, I, I like, we don't know that these things are pronounced this way, right? It's the middle Chinese uh, relationships in terms of semantics and phonetics that are being explained by the supposition that you have an S prefix and the, the sound change in question. And then, you know, these sound changes in question are buttressed by the Shaxing evidence we looked at earlier. But th these are, um, th these examples are morphologically uh, motivated, even if, as you see on the first one on the slide, that sometimes they also coincide with, with Shaxing evidence, right? Okay. Now, continuing on with um, circumstantial noun prefix, uh, Yes. So we have mang, to flee, to disappear, to die, and the song, uh, mourning or burial. So, uh, uh, you know, an, an institution or an object associated with death. But notice that uh, the first one, flee, disappear, is type B, and the second one uh, is type A. So it's not, you know, in this case, it's not just an, an S prefix is also a change from type B to type A. And that's kind of quite interesting. There are, you know, other um, examples of, let's say, morphologically related words, uh, one of which is type A and one of which is type B. Um, 
but which su suggests that at some level in history, uh, the the type A B distinction was segmental. Yeah, I, I think that's what it suggests to me, at least. Um, uh, they don't have any explanation for the, this kind of alternation, uh, but do flag it in the book as like kind of, I don't know, the frontier of etymological research in Chinese is to really systematically look at these A, B alternations. Uh, but for our purposes here, it's just a, a, let's say, a confounding factor in the the analysis of the, the S circumstantial prefix. And then we're not talking about loose pre, pre initials, you know, here now, but I just want to throw it in there because it's also uh, this this circumstantial use of the s prefix uh, that this example of um, uh, to take or use let and the handle of a plow or sickle, an instrument for holding or an instrument for taking uh, so let in their reconstruction. Um, and those are those are all of the their examples of, of, of circumstantial noun prefix s. Yeah. Okay, so um, now we're going. That was just sort of setting up the. Oh, look, it's uh, you know there these are the the kinds of morphological relationships or semantic relationships for which we posit these morphological relationships. And now we're going to look at it from the phonological perspective. So on the basis of etymological arguments, Baxter and Cigar reconstruct STS and STSH, let's say, as origins of, of S. So let's look at it. Uh, so STS, we have a set joint of bamboo and sit, uh, which is knee. So, you know, looks like they're etymologically related, and maybe ni has an s prefix. Um, I will mention that that this word meaning joint, including of the body, it has very good Sino-Tibetan uh, cognates, uh, but without, you know, I don't know, or those cognates I know of don't have an s prefix. Not that that argues against an s prefix in Chinese. I don't think it really does. And in in a very early moment. This is one of the earliest sound changes. Uh, ik and it merge, and they merge as it. If you, if you just look at these Middle Chinese, your temptation would be to reconstruct it as, you know, sit, and that would be totally fine. That's like totally fine in their system. But, um, and I even think, actually, I even think in the Shijing, Generally speaking, you can't distinguish it and ik, um, you know, either because there just aren't enough rhymes or because the sound change has already happened. So this is a really tricky one to um, to distinguish, and they do it based on Sheshang series. Uh, and then the next one, uh, claw, uh, which is uh, tru, and then uh, scratch. Has has an S, S initial and you scratch with claws. So this might be the valence increasing one. But these uh, are not without uh, difficulty. So uh, ni is not an instance of valence increasing or circumstantial noun. Uh, and uh, and then they also mentioned that this 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 R you know it, it doesn't come up in scratch the R medial. Okay, so now the aspirate version. We have a clear uh, cheng and star, which they etymologize, et, sorry, etymologize to that which is bright. And they acknowledge that uh, there's, again, this difficulty that uh, the uh, type, that the one is type B and one is type A. And this proposed pair of cognates would not be so compelling, I would say, because of the semantics, right? It's like, okay, star is the thing is bright, I guess, but not all stars are bright, or it just seems a little far-fetched to me. Yeah. Um, but uh, there are um, there are dialect, uh, so min dialect supports an initial TSH in the word for star. So that suddenly makes it go from seeming like quite speculative. 
to, I think, a very strong proposal. Okay. Now uh, we have uh, you know this other cluster. We're just going through the clusters. So on the basis of the following pairs of words, you know they reconstruct. I don't want to pronounce it, uh, but SQHR as one source of SR. So place and uh, and place. So without further discussion, this derivation, you know, to me it looks kind of unconvincing, but. Uh, notice this line from the odes where where we are chopping trees and we say uh, we chop trees hack hack yeah where the 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 first character is used for the chopping sound uh, and then it's quoted uh, in in the entry for the character swa the second character in the show with you know, the second character in place of the first character. So this suggests that, uh, you know, let's say that, that, that at one point, these two characters had very similar readings, or at least that both of them were, were, were sounds that could be used for the sound of, of, of hacking at wood. Yeah. So uh, I think that Philological evidence uh, bolsters the idea. Okay, now one of the, you know, I don't know, one of the more complicated proposals, SMT goes to Z. So they think, uh, as evidence of that, you have place, to place something. And uh, then this uh, mat. So a place for putting things. And, um, you need the M in order to get the voicing, right? Yeah, that's why you need the M there, phone uh, uh, phonologically speaking. But they do not account for a morphological function of the M prefix or the R infix in, in the word for place. So uh, yeah, so then moving on. Um, We've already looked at this example, uh, but the point here is uh, that this uh, relationship between look, see, and show uh, argues for this sound change of uh, S, G to J uh, in type B syllables, and I believe only before front vowels. Uh, okay, now we have this pair. And this one is a little more tricky, right? Because you 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 have to posit this intermediate step. So ascend is is tongue, and increase is thung. And then they uh, propose that this t initial, because we know it's etymologically related to a t initial, began life as st. Okay. And then something similar here, where there are two readings of uh, this character, one that means blame and one that means demand payment, and the one that means blame uh, pretty straightforwardly goes back to trek, uh, but the one that means demand payment straightforwardly would go back to trek. Uh, but then they think, well, because of the etymological connection, maybe better to take that even further back to the rec. Okay. But I'll just say that from my perspective, the der derivation from blame to demand payment is, is not obviously a case of a valence increasing. Okay. Um, moving along. So we have S before a voiceless R. So you have pluck uh, and reap, and you have colorful and color countenance, where you have. Um, these connections between ta and sra. Now, I, I will just point out that, that this is a, uh, you know, there's a lot going on in these examples, and the same a lot is going on in both of them. Yeah, so, uh, so the ta origin, which they reconstruct for as from sa, sha, is type A, has a voiceless initial, and has a glottal stop. 
Whereas the surah initial readings uh, have uh, are R type uh, B and have a final K. So they admit that they have no idea what's going on here, but it, it may be some kind of dialect variation. Uh, and I will mention here that there are other cases of etymological relationships between final K words and final result stop words. And I think that is something that generally speaking needs more work done on. Okay. Now, um, uh, yeah, so STH goes to tra. So here we have push away and urge. So tui and tui. Uh, and then I would also say that, you know, if they only have one example of this, like OST oh, changes to TS, then it would seem very ad hoc and very silly, right? But you see that there are a lot of these kinds of connections in different manners of articulation. So it seems like a pretty, um, you know, it seems like even if their particular phonetic solution is not right, uh, definitely the phenomenon is real, yeah? Okay. And now, uh, yeah, on to pre-initial capital N. And in some ways, this is the both the simplest and the most controversial. Maybe, maybe actually it's most controversial because it's the simplest, because then it means everyone can understand what we're arguing about. There are um, alternations in Middle Chinese, like attested in Middle Chinese, between transitive and intransitive verbs. Generally speaking, and all the examples on this slide, um, they're written with the same character, but they're not always written with the same character. If that's a kind of a question of history. Yeah? So we look at the first one. So we have the reading ken, meaning see, and the, the reading ren, which remember go, probably, or most certainly goes back to a G. So let's just say gen, meaning appear. So we have ken, gen, see, appear. We have bei, bei, defeat, suffer defeat. We have quay, guay, destroy, be destroyed. We have tuan, cut in two, and duan, be cut in two, and chet, bend, break, and jet, bend. So, and that's transitive and intransitive bend, right? Bend something and for something to bend. So, so this much I want to I want to really emphasize. Everyone agrees on it's just a fact, right? If you if you look at uh, Middle Chinese uh, readings, you have two readings and two meanings of these characters, and they have this relationship where the the voiceless is transitive and the voiced is intransitive. Now, I'll just say for those of you who care, but if you don't, you can kind of turn off your brain for a few seconds. The other camp, basically, on this question is Mei Tsulin, who thinks that the, the voiced form is original, and it is made voiceless from an S prefix. And he points to the fact that there are lots of S prefixes to make causatives in Tibetan Burman languages. But as we've seen, Baxter and Sigar also think uh, there's a good comparison to be made between that evidence in Tibetan Burman and a phenomenon in Chinese. But the phenomenon in Chinese that they're pointing to is this thing we've seen before of, um, we, you know, which is all the places they reconstruct an S prefix for, which is to say, so Baxter and Sagar reconstruct an S causative. Everyone agrees there's an S causative prefix. Baxter and Sagar reconstruct a different uh, situation as an S causative prefix. So they have to, if you like, they also want to, but they have to explain these alternations in a different way. Uh, Etienne, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, I, I just have a, a small question, but isn't it possible that uh, this uh, kind of became productive later on, uh, let's say like in late uh, old Chinese, uh, the voiced, voiceless, uh, uh, opposition uh, got kind of uh, grammaticalized, was perceived as uh, being a way to create uh, uh, intransitive verbs from transitive or vice versa, and that uh, therefore some of these uh, uh, words could actually be secondary. Is this, uh, I don't know if there is some evidence for this, maybe not, uh, but I, I would think that this is something that would very easily, uh, once 
uh, in the language that, that would very easily become productive because uh, that's something you might need to uh, create new transitive or intransitive verbs uh, uh, on one route. Uh, yeah, I mean that sounds fine to me, but um, but uh, but sort of two points. One is the phenomenon has to have an origin point. Yeah, which I mean you'll agree with these, both of these points. The phenomenon has to have an origin point, which is to say some of these examples will be old and will have some explanation. Uh, and then also I would say that although this is kind of probably the most common. Um, uh, let's say syllable internal morphological um, happening in Chinese, yeah, which is as really uncontroversial that something morphological is going on here. It's not that common, you know. It's it's not like it, it's not clear to me that there was ever a moment where you could really apply this across the board. You could take any verb and make it transitive by by divorcing it or any verb and making it uh, intransitive by voicing it. So, um, which is not to say, let's say, um, that, that's, that some examples might be secondary, you know, uh, just to, to, to return to something I said on the first day, we can make new strong verbs in English based on analogy, right? But uh, it's not, uh, you know, you wouldn't be comfortable, you know, so, so even though it, it's productive in some sense, you know, we can make new strong verbs, we do make new strong verbs, it's not very productive. And that's my sort of intuition about this. It's like, mm, most of the cases are probably inherited, even if some of them are secondary, because it never becomes a super widespread phenomenon. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so how do Baxter and Sagar uh, explain these? They, so, so just a sort of historical excursus, Sagar proposes that the Chinese this is in 1993, that's what I have on the slide. I would have thought it was 1999, but maybe, no, it's an earlier paper, 1993, yeah. Uh, proposed that a Chinese intransitive voicing prefix must have been some kind of nasal. I mean, it's not a crazy idea, right? Nasals oftentimes voice things, uh, but still needs to be proposed. Uh, he proposes it based on uh, the high tone min voiced initial in the Chinese loan word be cracked, which, and this, you know, you have to ask the Hmong Mian people about this, but a high tone voiced initial in uh, Mian uh, suggests a proto Yao pre nasalized voice initial. So let's just put it differently. In this word be cracked, which is here, it's the, it's the, very last thing on this slide, there's evidence that when this word was borrowed into uh, Mian, it had a nasal on it. So that's the kind of starting point for Cigar of proposing that the voicing alternation you see here has to do with a nasal prefix. I will just point out, I, th I think this is the right place to do it, that in the meantime, a lot more evidence uh, inside Tibeto Burman has come up, particularly uh, in the Gyaurangic language family, they have a kind of a very productive anti-passive voiced uh, nasal prefix. So, and, and importantly, they also have a causative with an S prefix. So in, in, in Gyaurang, you can like, I'm mean, this is how it's stylized, but in Gyaurang, you could have like a verb um, to, to, uh, uh, well, let's I, what's a good verb to let's say let's try it with bend yeah it, you can have bend is something like uh, let's say it's pend is the verb and then you can have bend would mean to become bent and you would have spend would mean to make someone bend something like that uh, so they have both in Gaorong used for the same things that Baxter and Cigar proposed uh, old Chinese for. Now, you, you might think if you're, um, you know, a, a critic of this kind of line of thinking, well, you know, is it a coincidence that uh, Guillaume Jacques worked very closely with uh, Laurent Sagar and that Guillaume Jacques works on Gyarangic? And so is, are we reading Chinese through sort of Gyarangic colored lenses? And I would, I would argue that uh, historically speaking, that is not correct, 
like it's it's almost the uh, seems to be the opposite, which is Baxter and Cigar proposed S for one thing, and they proposed a prefix N for one thing, based entirely on Chinese data. And then it turned out that there were living languages that um, that exhibited both of those very robustly, which is kind of uh, you know uh, maybe even great evidence that they were right in, in terms of uh, it's like the discovery of laryngeals and Hittite or something, which is to say like um, something theory driven turned out to exist in the real world. Okay. Any case, here's the same slide you saw before, but now with old Chinese provided in the Baxter cigar system. So, uh, you know, basically uh, it's what you expected to see, which is to say uh, the, the, the transitive is voiceless and the intransitive has had a, this nasal prefix added to it. So that's how they uh, reconstruct these uh, alternations. Now, just moving along with this, um, this nasal prefix, uh, it also does some work for them uh, with laterals. So, um, so basically, you know, capital N R, we saw this actually already in the Sheisheng evidence uh, slide. Uh, capital N R would merge with L and then L would develop into middle Chinese as it would other, anyhow. Yeah, so it becomes ya in type B syllables and da in type A syllables. So this way uh, they connect, uh, for instance, to flow with, to, uh, to float or swim and pendants of a banner or cap with pendants of a banner and exhausted with exhausted and covet with excess or licentious. Now, what you can say is the morphological meaning of kind of uh, uh, anti-causative is not at all clear in these examples, uh, but you know, what can you do? It, uh, th th they've posited a, a piece of morphophonology and it will get some work done here as well. Uh, they find no reason to reconstruct this before voiceless resonance, which is interesting. Okay, and then we already saw in, in our discussion of Sheshang uh, series that you can reconstruct an M or a capital N uh, when a, uh, a, a, a velar nasal kind of interferes into a, uh, a, a uvular Sheshang series. Well, uh, here we have etymological arguments for the same type of change. And here, uh, at least in the first one, it's, um, it works in terms of the morphological function that we are proposing for this N prefix. So to frighten and to scare and, and sorry, to be scared are related. And then maybe great and proper or refined are related. Uh, yeah, and as I mentioned, we saw Sheisheng evidence for this proposal as well. Okay. Now, I, can I, yeah, I'll just try and whiz through this uh, M pre-initial. So the morphological um, function of the M prefixes include making verbs volitional, which we actually saw evidence for in when we were looking at these two character writings of words in the shujing and a human body prefix and an animal prefix. Okay, so in terms of making things volitional, we have uh, a wrap or bundle and then carry in the arms, prop up support, uh, plant, place upright, uh, put together, be combined, come together, bring together, and then uh, warn and warn, warn or avoid. So their argument is, so I, I mean, this is a kind of, we have to be careful here, right? Because the, alter, the, the phonological alternation in Middle Chinese is exactly the same that we saw in the case of the transitive intransitive verbs. It's just voicing. But when the voicing is kind of anti-causative in meaning, they reconstruct an N prefix. And when the voicing is volitional in meaning, they reconstruct an M prefix. 
Now they have reasons for distinguishing those that N and that M, but uh, it's just to say that you know sometimes the the something to be on your toes about. Sometimes a, a in their system a, a phonetic difference is motivated entirely on a semantic uh, basis. Okay, and then uh, here just with with uh, aspirates. I'll just look at the third one. So earth and sacrifice to the spirit of the soil. Um, and then with voiced uh, initials. And this one is even more sort of subtle because the voicing effect of the prefix is unrecognizable when it acts upon voice roots. So let's say if you want to caricature their behavior, when a character has two meanings, one of which is uh, non-volitional and one of which is volitional, they posit an M prefix purely on the basis of the volitional reading, you know, with no evidence of a, a phonetic difference, at least in principle. You have to be on guard against that as a risk. Yeah. So, so just to look at, um, let's say, um, well, the first one, even and make even. Yeah, the only difference there is volition. Now, the, in the second one, yeah, there are two readings. So it's not, you know, but that has to do with the tone. There's no reason to point a, diff a, a positive different initial. Um, but for, uh, but let's say having kind of said, you know, this seems awfully speculative, which is certainly what some of the reviews said. Uh, in some cases, they have they have other evidence like dialect evidence and uh, loan word evidence for making this distinction. The question is, even if you can make the distinction in some cases based on other evidence, does that permit you to uh, to make the distinction when the only evidence is is semantic? And that's a kind of uh, you know philosophy of science question that I think people could genuinely come down on different uh, places uh, with. So now just uh, continuing, so, so we have this alternation uh, before L. And this example is problematic uh, because the M doesn't seem to have an obvious function and because the lateral is voiceless in one case and voiced in the other case. Okay, and then I'll stop with the animal prefixes where uh, you you can have multiple readings of a, uh, a character that refers to an animal. So they point in particular to frog and to a certain kind of bird. And they think that, you know, uh, the, this, this alternation can be explained uh, with an M prefix. Uh, and then they also have it for fawn and for deer. And in the case of deer, there is evidence uh, in in this uh, this buyang, uh, which is which is I think a kradai the language seems to have borrowed the Chinese word for deer, and they borrowed it with an M prefix. So now, kind of, yeah, there is evidence for this this M prefix in some animal names. I, personally, I don't like. I feel uncomfortable with what's going on here because, like, well, okay, so you have a word for frog, which was which is a great word for frog. <laughs> and then you decide, oh, I'm going to stick an M prefix on it to make it more clear that it's a frog. Well, then what's the difference between the two words for frog? And it just, I don't, I don't quite, I don't feel comfortable with these animal prefixes. And there's also body part prefixes in, in Sino-Tibetan. And I would like to see more parallels of them. And actually there is, you know, I, I, I really got into the, in, 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 into a sort of a tussle with I mean, privately, with Guillaume Jacques about this was, and he pointed out that there is some kind of uh, uh, buh morpheme in a lot of Indo-European animal names. So there, let's, let's say there are analogical phenomena where you can kind of make words seem more similar to each other because they're semantically related. They can kind of lead to things that sort of look like, you know, animal morphemes, but, but they're not derivational. You know, you don't say oh, like, oh, this is the frog that's not an animal without the M and this is the frog that is an animal with the M. So, so I feel kind of uncomfortable in this, in this area. But um, let's say once again, the evidence is real, right? These different readings of the character in middle Chinese are real and they need some explanation. And this is not a crazy explanation.